All right. Uh, so, um, uh, Corey and uh, Alessandro, we have a class here and then a uh, few people online here. Um, so, uh, both, uh, you know, we're kind of combining uh, our institute seminar with uh, the class seminar that uh, I have this semester. Uh, so, uh, so folks, we have a treat today. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, uh, two exciting presenters today. Uh, in a way, it is a kind of a special deal because um, uh, so many people, students from, uh, you know, so many of our students have worked with uh, both of these at uh, the Bosch Research. Um, Alessandro is the president of the Carnegie Bosch Research Inst uh, Bosch Institute and is senior research scientist at Bosch um, Center in AI in Pittsburgh. And uh, Corey Hansen is uh, uh, the lead uh, research scientist at also the same institute. Um, they both also work in neuro uh, symbolic AI and uh, associated areas of knowledge representation and uh, such. Um, both of them have had very distinguished career. Um, no, number of students have learned uh, by mentoring with them and I've had also other ways to engage with both of them. Uh, so it's fantastic. And, um, uh, you know, uh, through this presentation, you're going to get a, um, uh, I think, interesting view of uh, uh, true research lab, uh, the work uh, by researchers at an industry research lab. Uh, so again, among the uh, presenters we have had, we heard, you know, people in many different roles, uh, some very industry, but not in research, more in applied, some are in more uh, more research and of course we had academic presenters pre presenters so um uh they are going to talk about causal analysis and decision intelligence for manufacturing at bosch so with that uh alessandro and cory please talk over yeah thanks a lot um can you guys see my slides yep Okay, um, so I figure we start with just a, a bit of background um, about Bosch. Um, and by the way, I, I can't really see if anybody asks questions, so I guess just interrupt throughout the presentation. Um, I think that would be better anyway. Um, but yeah, um, so Bosch is a fairly large company, um, and we do business in various different areas. Um, I guess primarily you could say that we work in mobility, so automotive, um, developing kind of um, vehicle parts and components. Um, but we also have business within energy and building technologies, um, consumer goods like appliances and power tools. And uh, up and coming area is the ind industrial technology. So building factories and smart manufacturing technologies. Um, and it's actually this last area that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, primarily. Um, we also do business uh, across the world. Um, primarily, um, we're focused in Europe um, and in Asia, but we also have some smaller footprint in North America. Um, as far as research goes, we have nine research offices um, worldwide. Um, three of them are in the United States. So we have one in Sunnydale, um, one in Pittsburgh, and one in Boston. And the, our research headquarters is in Rennigan, Germany. Um, and bo but both Alessandro and I work out of the Pittsburgh office. Um, and here we primarily do research on security technologies and AI. Um, and as of this year, um, Pittsburgh is home of the Bosch Caddy Research Group, uh, which is focused on causal analysis and decision intelligence. Cool. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, right. So I just want to introduce a little bit um, the, the the Carnegie Bosch Institute, um, what it is, a little bit of history, so a couple of slides. Uh, next one, please, Corey. So the, the the picture you see on the on the right there is the the building, the actual building where we are located, uh, in the CMU campus. Um, so actually, the CBI. Um, uh, 
was founded in the 1990s and through an um, uh, endowment from Bosch. Um, and originally, the, the institute uh, used to be part of the School of Business. Uh, so the main focus was to um, advance and, and, and form, I would say, educate managers and researchers in, you know, in the area of uh, business management, uh, global business, uh, and so on. So <clears throat> over the years, this uh, shifted a little bit um, towards uh, more technology-oriented uh, fields. Um, particular, of course, you know, AI, um, cybersecurity, and uh, and sustainability as a kind of overarching also topic, uh, uh, um, which is getting more and more important, especially when we look at you know AI, large language models these days, and energy consumption and so on. Um, so, um, well, you know, I actually took over uh, not even three weeks ago, so. Um, I've been involved also in Carnegie Bosch Institute for a couple of years now as an industry mentor. And, um, you know, after our president left, I, I took over, was asked to take over. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, these initiatives that you see there are the most recent ones. Uh, so since 2019, we supported the uh, uh, CMU faculty uh, projects for a total of around $2 million. And since last year, we actually uh, started a, a postdoctoral fellowship program. Uh, is a is a two year award, uh, which uh, spans from seventy to ninety k per year, depending also on the uh, faculty slash department we work with. They have different thresholds within CMU, and um, in general, you know, this is a, a an alliance, as you would see also in, in our website, if you if you care to take a look there. Uh, is an alliance between industry and academia. So, you know, the role that the, the Institute that is part of the College of Engineering at CMU is really to support research, cutting edge research, I should say, uh, in different ways, uh, you know, from funding research projects, you know, uh, uh, funding chair professorships, uh, uh, conferences, but also, you know, being an active part of it. It's not just, um, you know, uh, we are donors, we, we, we provide uh, support, but we also are, we, and we will be more and more involved into the research uh, agenda, uh, both CMU and Bosch. And of course, there is a lot of osmosis with Bosch um, in this sense, uh, but uh, you know, I use the word osmosis because it's really more like a, an interdependency rather than you know, Bosch mandating particular aspects of how CBI operates. Uh, and also we sponsor, though, because we are part of CMU, we sponsor campus-wide initiatives, for instance, hackathons. Next slide, please. And yeah, just, uh, you know, um, wanted to add a, a few details about the fellowship. Uh, so we are not interested really in, uh, you know, funding short-term research or 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 just being a place where a postdoc comes uh, to, to just wait to apply for a uh, for a for a tenure track job, uh, this eventually is the goal, right? To to support postdocs uh, uh, to apply for top tier universities, um, but the, in terms of research, uh, you know, we really are shooting for grand challenge style problems. Uh, and you know, you know, I don't want to spend too much time to define what a grand challenge is, but you know, this is the idea of you know long term research, let's say, in different areas and. When you see AI, cybersecurity, sustainability, these are the main uh, strategic uh, areas, I would say, but uh, that doesn't prevent us from you know, uh, adding uh, additional topics uh, as also we see fit. And then as we expand our network within CMU, as a matter of fact, you know, the way we do these postdocs is that uh, we pair an applicant with a faculty host. And currently we have around uh, 60 faculty hosts registered in, at CMU. And you know it's not a, a requirement that you you need to be you need to know one of these faculty or one of these professors. We had many uh, instances where students of other universities, of course, uh, are interested in the uh, in the in the postdoc fellowship, and so they reach out. Uh, so they have a specific topic. They reach out to professors here working in that topic, and that becomes you know a way in which this uh, research project you know can uh, can uh, can start and can be and can be successful. Um, 
Yes, and then you know, just uh, in terms of uh, you know how, how is this going? Uh, as I said, we started last year, so we had forty six applications. We extended five offers. We only had two people um, uh, declining the offers for personal reasons, so three acceptances. And this year, we we added uh, you know ten more applications in the overall pool, and now we are looking at a hundred percent acceptance rate. So it's very it's, it's going very very well, of course. And you know, the future in the future, we also aim to to um, expand a little bit the breadth of, of our reach and, and try something uh, beyond uh, the, past, the postdoctoral fellowships. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we've, we've designed, divided this, um, this presentation into two parts, um, focused on, uh, the first part is on causal analysis, and the second part will be on uh, decision intelligence, which um, Alessandro will discuss. Um, and this is the kind of the beginnings of a, a new research group we formed in, um, in the Pittsburgh office, focused on these, these types of technologies. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about this problem of root cause analysis um, within manufacturing. So, so root cause analysis is the, the process of, you know, identifying um, the factors that contribute to some problem within a production line, let's say, yeah. Um, and these problems can be typically some uh, malfunctioning or abnormal product or really any type of anomaly um, that, that occurs in the production of a product, yeah. Um, and if you look at the um, if you look at the chart on the bottom left, you'll see kind of this little triangle, um, which is labeled quality check. Um, so periodically within a manufacturing process, you know, a, a product will be analyzed and evaluated to, towards its quality. Yeah, if it if it passes this quality check, then it goes on to the other phases of the um, production process. Um, but if not, then the product is just um, scrapped at this point, right? Because um, we want to, you know, save resources and not develop a product that's not going to make it to the end anyway. Yeah. And so our, our goal is really to catch um, these, these malfunctions um, or abnormal products as quickly as possible so that we scrap them and save the resources. Um, and actually this, this decision on whether to scrap a product and when to decide to scrap a product is actually a fairly interesting use case for kind of the advanced decision intelligence work that um, that Alessandro is working on. And this is going to talk about um, later on. But as far as the root cause analysis problem goes, so our goal is to, um, whenever one of these quality checks fails, is to find the the reason why it failed. Yeah. Um, so if if you look at the the chart on the the, the right hand side. Um, at the very the very end, you'll see kind of this quality issue Q node. Um, and then basically the, the rest of the nodes um, within this chart represent a causal graph. So these are the causal relations um, that are representative of the manu entire manufacturing process, or at least within this small sample case. Yeah. Um, and so our goal is to find is to find a uh, a path from this quality failure check to some root cause uh, within this causal graph. Yeah, um, in this path we refer to it as the failure path. Um, so there's different types of there's different types of um, root cause analysis. Um, another way of saying this is that there's there's uh, several different um, possible solutions that are acceptable. Um, so on one level, you might be um, willing to just accept uh, information about the location or the time in which um, some failure event occurred, right? So you might want to just say that some event occurred within station two, um, which led to the failing quality check. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you might want to get down to kind of a more granular level and you want to understand the actual parameter um, which, which led to the failure, right? So we might want to say there was some force um, placed upon some material within station two, which eventually led to the failure quality check, right? So this is far more specific. Um, but 
But if, if you if you have a keen eye, you look at the, the chart on the bottom right, you'll see like within station two, we have this force F parameter. Um, this is actually not the root cause, um, but it is the, the, the final parameter that we have that is observed. Yeah. So the, actually the root cause within this failure path is this variable K you'll see kind of within the raw material column. So this represents the, some characteristic of the material, particularly the stiffness of the material that's used to develop the product. Um, so the, the, the issue here is that this characteristic of a material is not observed, right? So this is not something that we can detect by um, through, through some sensor uh, readings. Um, and because it's not observed, it's typically not considered within causal analysis. Um, and it's not considered within the root cause analysis. Yeah. Um, and so the, the basic idea I want to get across here is simply that to, to do this type of root cause analysis requires, uh, you know, a good understanding of the causal relations between all the features of the system, in this case, the production line. Um, and so, this is often represented as a causal graph. Yep. So, Corey, how, how much... Uh... Uh, representation or modeling uh, do you have in this case of let's say uh, raw materials um, the uh, if you if you want whosoever whether or system or the human to analyze um, uh, to find the root cause uh, and some of those aspects of root cause may not be um, as you said observed or may not be they may not be sensor looking for um, uh, you know the stiffness of the material that and the particular part uh, is not as stiff as it should be or the, or the way around. How much of the metadata and all the, you know, information is there? Uh, is it in the database? Is it in something that happened that you were not, not measured? And now, given that you suspect a problem, you're going to test that pipe and say whether that was stiff or not. Um, and how much of that will be available? Because... Uh, to provide an environment for a lot of automated analysis, you'll have to have lots of data about everything that uh, goes into the system. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this is the crux of the issue. So um, on the one hand, the, the root cause analysis that typically takes place does not consider this type of information. So it will, it will consider the observed information coming from the sensors and ignore this type of prior knowledge um, that, that is not directly observable from the sensors. Um, as far as where that information lies, um, this is something it's kind of dependent on the system. But I mean, in some cases it can be, you know, within the head of the, the, the workers in the factory, you know, um, in some cases when we're a bit better prepared, it could be in a database somewhere. Um, but yes, it, it, this is, information is typically not well aggregated and integrated into kind of some overall um, system, like information management system. Um, so this is this is kind of a this is an issue that we need to work through um, in order to do this more types of advanced uh, root cause analysis. Yeah. Did that answer the question at all? Or kind of yeah. dodge it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just that uh, uh, we are going to expect, if you want the machine to be more automated, you're going to expect more uh, in terms of all the investment that goes to prepare for such a system. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. many times companies are not willing to put in all that investment and deal with the issue as they arise. This, this is definitely the case. Um, data management is often an issue. Um, if, if we can show that certain types of information is valuable for this type of analysis, then we can convince them to start collecting it and managing it. Um, but that's a, yeah, that's something we have to work towards. Okay, so as I was saying, like, um, in order to do this type of analysis, we need a, a really good causal graph. Um, and that's kind of leads us to the next stage of, of, of our work is to actually figure out how to develop these causal graphs. Um, and this is typically referred to as causal discovery. Um, there's a couple different ways in, in, in which people do this. 
Um, the first is simply to use domain experts. So in our case, you know, there's somebody who works at the factory who knows the production line very well. They might actually sit down and start writing out, um, you know, the causal relations between the various components of the system. Yeah. Um, now, there's a lot of issues with this. One, it's it's very error prone. Two, it's time consuming. Um, and I mean, it might work for systems that are fairly small and contained, right, with only a few parameters or variables. Um, unfortunately, at Bosch, we have manufacturing process lines with that are very complex, and no single person can really understand how the inner workings of the entire thing. So this really isn't feasible for us. Um, so the second solution is to kind of derive these causal graphs from observation data um, using statistical causal AI methods. Yeah. Um, and so this is definitely the approach we want to take, um, but they're, they're not foolproof either. There's several issues with these statistical methods. Um, the first is really data quality issues in that we're often missing a lot of information. Um, this could be due to several reasons. Um, one could be simply sampling, um, sampling issues with long tail distributions. Um, the second could be, you know, sensor failures, which tend to occur quite often. Um, and the third, as, as we were talking about before, you know, there are causal um, parameters which are simply unobservable um, and therefore are currently basically ignored uh, within, within the causal graphs. Um, so basically this leads to, um, when we run the causal AI statistical methods, this leads to causal graphs, but they're ultimately incomplete. Um, and they're incomplete in a couple of different ways. So in one way we could say that they're there's an incomplete set of causal relations, right? So we know the parameters of the graph, but there are some relations or links between those parameters that are simply not uh, well established. Um, and this typically occur occurs because of the missing observational data. Um, and then the second issue would be an incomplete set of causal nodes, right? So this is the case where there are some, you know, some causal parameters that, that we simply are unaware of, yeah? Um, the, the second issue we, we deal with a lot is scalability. Um, I kind of mentioned this just a, a moment ago. But um, the current methods, the current causal AI methods can, can derive causal graphs with a few parameters, maybe a dozen, maybe a few dozen. Um, but then you start to reach complexity limits after that. Um, but we have, we have process lines which have thousands, tens of thousands of causal parameters. Um, and so these are, this is an orders of magnitude difference. And so we really need to start thinking outside the box to figure out how to develop causal graphs of this scale um, to do this kind of root cause analysis. Yeah. And so we're starting to think through what a, what a, a causal discovery uh, pipeline or architecture would look like um, to, de to deal with these types of issues. Um, the, so the first couple of stages look fairly familiar or traditional. So we want to be able to collect a, a lot of observation data from the process line, pro from the production line. Um, and then we can begin to generate um, causal graphs or at least small local causal graphs using kind of the traditional causal AI techniques, the statistical techniques. Um, but of course, as mentioned, the, these graphs will be fairly incomplete. Um, so so the, the third stage would be the ability to augment these causal graphs, right? So to resolve the data quality issues that I mentioned um, using neurosymbolic AI techniques, right? So basically we want to take these incomplete causal graphs and make them complete um, or as much as possible. And then the, the final stage on the right is the ability to generate large scale causal graphs, yeah? And we want to be able to resolve these scalability issues using foundation models or transformers. Yeah. Now, there's actually not much I can say about this last piece um, because of IP issues, but there's actually a, 
a small but growing community of researchers looking into uh, what's referred to as causal foundation models, um, which is exactly the issue that I mentioned. So basically, the ability to you know, use foundation models or transformers to infer causal relations and derive causal graphs um, so from some set of data. Um, but today, we're going to focus primarily on the first problem um, of augmenting causal graphs. And so, yeah, we want to use a, a nurse bucket solution for this, um, primarily trying to integrate um, some prior domain knowledge into the causal discovery process to try to overcome these issues of um, missing observational data. And so the primary intuition we have here is that, so the, the knowledge graph community, the neurospelic AI community has been developing techniques for knowledge graph completion for some time now. And it seems reasonable to kind of assume or to be able to assume that the, this problem of causal graph completion can be mapped to a knowledge graph completion problem, right? And can be solved using the knowledge graph completion techniques like link prediction, yeah? So on, on the right, you could kind of see a, a very um, general architecture of how this might work, right? So we can derive some causal graph um, from some observational data from a production line. Um, we can develop, begin to develop the, a knowledge graph with the domain knowledge of this production line. And then we can integrate the two together, right? Using into one kind of holistic knowledge graph. And then from this holistic knowledge graph, we can train uh, link prediction models, which can then be used to um, infer or derive new causal relations um, that may have been missed um, using the, the, the traditional techniques, yeah? And I mean, we think this is a, a fairly interesting um, solution to this problem. Um, but in fact, it's actually just one example of a, a larger um, area of research that's that we're referring to as causal neurosomalic AI, um, which is, I guess, can be described as an attempt to utilize neurosomalic AI techniques to improve on existing causal AI tasks. Right, so th this could be, we this this could be implemented in several ways. So it could be, you know, the use of knowledge graphs and knowledge graph embeddings for representing causal graphs, um, for integrating domain prior domain knowledge into causal graphs, as I mentioned. Um, it could be using knowledge graph completion techniques uh, like link prediction to do causal discovery, um, or it could be using knowledge graph reasoning techniques to implement causal reasoning. Yeah, so this could be um, the types of causal reasoning that people often do would be effect estimation. Um, so trying to, to infer the, the strength of particular causal relations. It could be um, trying to predict the effect of interventions. It could be counterfactual reasoning. Yeah. Um, I think there's a there's kind of a blue sky research here. I think there's a lot to be done in trying to understand the synergies between the, the call, current causal AI work and the neurosomalic AI techniques that are being developed. Um, and I, I should say a lot of this work is being spearheaded, of course, from the University of South Carolina and the AI Institute um, by Ukash and Jamini. Okay, so. So if we go back to thinking about the link prediction um, specifically, there's, there's different types of inferencing we can do with this. Um, so first, just to understand the causal relation. Um, so we can understand the causal relation that the head would be um, often referred to as a treatment. The tail um, is referred to as an outcome. Um, and so with that, we can basically try to implement some causal prediction inference. Right, so given the, the treatment or the cause, we try to predict what the, the outcome or the downstream effect would be. Right, so this will be similar to like, you know, um, predicting the effect of some intervention or forecasting some future occurrence. Yeah. Um, going the other way, 
um, we could try to um, implement causal um, explanation inferencing. So given the outcome or the effect, we want to try to predict the cause, um, right? So we want to be able to attribute some responsibility for um, some effect that is observed. So this is kind of what we would be doing for the root cause analysis as an example. There's some challenges here that we're facing. So it, it turns out that causality is actually a, a fairly complex hyperrelation um, with causal effect estimation weights. Um, so not all causal relations are equivalent. So actually there are um, strength values associated with these causal um, relations, right? So like uh, how strong is the causal connection between treatment and outcome? Um, and it turns out that, that the, the current state-of-the-art link prediction methods cannot really handle these types of weighted relations very well. Um, there's some early work in this area, but it's, it's definitely not a solved problem. Yeah. Okay, so just to conclude this part, um, there's a couple of research questions um, that, that need to be addressed uh, with this line of research. So the first would be kind of just the, the basic hypothesis of whether, you know, knowledge graph link prediction can be used um, to tackle this problem of finding causal relations. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what, if, if it can be, then which, you know, link prediction algorithms um, perform better than others on this problem? Or do we need to actually come up with new techniques or new link prediction algorithms for this? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, the, the effect dealing with uh, weighted links is, is a bit of a challenge at the moment. Uh, we might need to develop new techniques for this. Um, which actually leads me to the next part, <laughs> which is how do causal effect estimations affect the performance? Yeah. Um, now we might assume that causal relations that have higher strength values would be easier to predict um, and that causal relations with lower strength values would be more difficult to predict. Um, but I, I think this needs to be um, evaluated and, and verified through experimentation, um, which currently hasn't been done too much yet. And then finally, how does domain knowledge affect performance, right? So um, now that we can integrate uh, or we can represent causal graphs um, as a knowledge graph, we can then begin to integrate a lot of different domain knowledge um, about the production line and then It'd be interesting to see how how well this affects our ability to discover new causal relations, right? So if we knew more information about the parameter types um, involved um, within our causal graph, that might lead to better performance. You know, or if we knew more about the the objects participating, um, then this might lead to better performance. So if you remember the the example we started with, it was. Um, Right, there was, a, there was some material and it had a stiffness value, right? Um, and it turned out that the stiffness value was the, the root cause of some downstream um, of failure. Uh, and as I mentioned, this, this is the type of information that is not currently included within the analysis. And it's not included within the existing causal graphs. And so I think this whole idea of causal neuroscience like AI and integrating causal graphs with knowledge graphs can really help to solve this problem of integrating domain knowledge. I think this is the real value of this line of research. I think you have a question, Corey. I see Kaushik uh, on the chat. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. I can't really see the chat at all. Well, I can repeat that for you if you want. Uh, so what is the typical vol volume of the data? Uh, since you are thinking of incorporating transformers that are extremely data hungry. I think he was referring to a particular slide or uh, something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so this, this is an issue at the moment that is um, very early stage research, I would say. I mean, yes, we need a lot of data if we want to, to um, to develop this this technology, um, 
but there, there's a couple different dimensions here. There's the amount of data and there's the variety of data, right? So if we simply want to build a, a model capable of like, you know, performing one specific task, right? So I don't know, inferring a specific type of causal relation. Um, we might need a lot of data, but it could be fairly um, straightforward what that data is, right? It could be a single type of data. Um, on the other hand, if we want to build a, a, you know, a foundation model that is capable of multiple different types of tasks, um, it could be, you know, inferring new causal relations, or it could be estimating parameter values or, or different types of things um, that, that people are looking at at the moment, then we need to integrate a lot of different types of information from the product line. Um, now, I will say within the causal, the, the causal AI community, there are problems with, there are problems with finding benchmarks that are, um, that can be used for this type of um, solution. Because as I said, the causal AI techniques can only handle a few values um, or they can only handle a few parameters, a few dozen parameters, right? A few tens of parameters at most. And so most benchmark data sets are at that level. So we don't actually have benchmark data sets for large scale causal graphs. They, they don't really exist at the moment. Um, and this is a, this is a, an issue. Um, the other issue that we find is um, I mentioned that, that that there are causal parameters in, in, re in a real world working system that are unobserved, right? Um, these are also not found in the existing benchmark data sets, right? Um, because, I mean, up to recently, nobody's really looking to solve this issue. Um, so it, 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 when we look at the, the, the benchmark data sets, they're kind of unsatisfactory. Um, and this is one of the first problems we need to be able to address is to, to generate such data sets that we can begin to build such systems. Okay, so in the next part, uh, I will um, talk a little bit about uh, decision intelligence. And I put for manufacturing uh, in parentheses because we, we have just started to uh, contemplate a couple of use cases there. So this is more like an introduction to decision intelligence rather than you know touching upon the specific use cases for manufacturing. Uh, so next slide, please. So first of all, you know, what uh, uh, is the definition of a decision intelligence? Um, so decision intelligence is typically considered um, a way to, um, so a, met a set of methods and technologies that can help support, augment and automate, uh, in some cases, decisions by linking data with outcomes. So this goes, uh, so it's generally, uh, I would say, neurosymbolic because it combines uh, um, you know, methods like uh, cognitive theories of decision, um, machine learning, knowledge bases, um, uh, procedural knowledge, so like expertise, uh, rule, rules uh, that can be encoded as, you know, uh, like um, heuristics that can be encoded as rules. Um, and, and this, of course, is not just, a, you know, a, a one way, but can, can be a system that uh, learns over time how to optimize decisions and recommendations on the basis of feedbacks from environment or from the decision makers themselves. Um, so the difference between AI and DI is that, you know, with the, with AI you can have a system that provide you some analytics on top of the data, but doesn't provide anything else. So everything is up to the human. Decision intelligence is a way to actually use that, um, let's say, le learned knowledge uh, uh, to inform uh, the decision process. And so, again, tying that to uh, predicted outcomes. Um, and the benefits of that is that, you know, uh, through this type of support, you get a much, uh, uh, let's say, a broader uh, uh, situational awareness, especially in, in data-intensive uh, uh, tasks and domains. 
Uh, typically, when you look at the practical problems, this leads to a reduction on the time of execution of, of tasks. And because these data intensive tasks in real scenarios are typically prone to error because they also depend on you know the level of expertise of the humans that make decision, you know, removing part of the of those errors, uh, you know, in, improves the accuracy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in general, when we look at decision intelligence, uh, I think you know there are three levels that we can uh, think of. Um, so decision support, and decision support is actually the the, the basic level of decision intelligence, where um, you know it's also you know the line uh, between decision support and AI analytics is very blurred at this point. I would say um, the decisions there uh, here are are uh, made entirely by humans. And so what, what the humans see are alerts or um, tools for data exploration or analytics that they can use uh, to make that decision. Um, in uh, decision augmentation, you have a situation where um, machine is providing, so the system, um, so me, I'm using machine systems, algorithms, kind of as, as synonyms, is providing, uh, is generating also recommendations and predictions. And so it's still up to the human to accept or not these recommendations, um, but but that uh, actually is the the additional level here. And uh, um, so I would say when we talk about uh, or when you hear about you know human human machine teaming, um, I say this is where most of the uh, times you know uh, decision intelligence uh, uh, um, resides. So decision augmentation. Um, and automation, I mean, is uh, uh, like you know, I would say it it corresponds to the to to, to um, you know uh, autonomous driving, if you want, in terms of level of autonomy. So here, there's no human in the loop; uh, all the decisions are made by the system. Human is still actually there in the background, uh, monitoring what's happening, assessing the risk, and in, in you know, uh, uh, in principle, uh, able to step in if need to. Um, and then, of course, you know, again, as I told before, this is a, a not, not a one way, uh, I would say, system, but something that can improve over time with mechanisms like reinforcement learning. Uh, and so, but again, the level of automation here is considered to be full with respect to augmentation, which is not full. Um, next slide, please. Right. Uh, Briefly, I wanted to mention some, you know, of the stakeholders, the you know, main actors in the field, and also some of the application fields. Um, and so, of course, you know, uh, the causal analysis, as as Corey, you know, just mentioned, you know, may be may benefit a little from from uh, from this type of technologies, especially I would say uh, when. Uh, in, in root cause analysis, for instance, has to be uh, uh, linked with um interesting i don't know if, it, if it's, it's, the, it's the only it's, i only see this but apparently apparently zoom thinks that i'm speaking chinese right and um and so you know some of the you know in root cause analysis of course it's important to identify the root but how that root then uh, affects the the overall processes uh, uh that underlies the decisions in a production line that is very important that's why causal analysis is, uh, is one of the main topics where decision intelligence can uh, help. But there are other, you know, um, let's say uh, domains like logistics, uh, you know, business management, um, content recommendation, um, you know, uh, uh, monitoring stock markets, uh, where you can understand where you know where the data are are very frequent and 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 massive in size. You know, uh, introducing these type of systems uh, can can definitely help uh, understand humans understand better the context, and so having so augmenting as we said before, situational awareness. By the way, uh, um, just a, a, a short note here. So I started working on this topic not yesterday, but uh, when uh, I still was CMU like a decade ago. And in projects related to cybersecurity, and in particular, there we were building decision augmentation systems for cyber defenders in, of military networks, and that is a very prototypical case of that of a data intensive scenario because when a, you know a cyber defender is defending a military network or any kind of network, by the way, um, 
um, there is a, you know these attacks are on a very small time scale you know uh, nanoseconds microseconds sometimes and uh, and so what the, what humans see typically is what systems like snort if you're familiar with it uh, can are able to filter out uh, of these uh, you know very uh, uh, um, fast uh, uh, incoming traffic in the network so there are rules that fire and that show patterns of attacks and so providing them with the help uh, uh, to uh, to manage that, that information to only provide to only show alerts where they are relevant to recommend mitigation strategies that's where decision intelligence is very important. But now, of course, you know the all this area that was developed, uh, uh, I would say, under under these grants on the part of defense is now, of course, uh, um, spreading a lot in in, in um, you know uh, uh, I would say in area and applications that are more of uh, the private sector. Uh, and, you know, Google, Alibaba, um, new new startups. I mean, I want to mention only this one. Uh, Rainbird is a startup in, based in UK. I think it's Nor is in uh, in Norwich, and they actually, you know, I would say talk about decision intelligence and neurosymbolic AI. So they have, uh, you know, you, you can check their website. Um, they have the type of approach where they combine neural symbolic approaches and methods. Next slide, please. Um, uh, yeah, maybe there is an animation here. Can you just click on it? Yeah. So, uh, just you know, to to, to just uh, maybe clarify what is our 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 approach here uh, in in Cadi. Um, uh, so when we look at generative AI, you know, typically models lack of grounding and reasoning. So in, we know that grounding impairs the capability to understand what the words refer to. So that's why we have you know these uh, hallucinations and some trivial mistakes. And reasoning, um, you know, uh, the lack of reasoning prevents uh, robustness and generalization. Um, in a few weeks, I'm gonna I'm going to Dagstuhl in Germany uh, to participate to a symposium that is called uh, uh, "Generalization by Machines and by People." And the focus of that symposium is exactly to discuss, you know, what what is the difference, how we can reduce the gap between these capabilities of generalization that humans have and, and machines typically don't have so um you know in a in a sense when, when when we look at you know again what is behind is lack of grounding and reasoning you know language in humans emerges from uh, from experience okay and uh, you know language conveys what what humans think uh, the, the, the sense of of a word for instance about the word, which is considered the reference. So that's the, so grounding meaning, you know, providing a reference to the words that you are using when you are, uh, you know, in, in your utterances, in your dialogues, in your in your writings and so on. Including also what they can infer, not just the knowledge uh, that is there, you can describe the facts, but also what you can infer. And so our approach is more like, you know, as, you know, uh, when, when you look at neurosymbolic AI, of course, there is a neural part, the neural component and the symbolic component. And, and and really, you know, uh, we try to take inspiration of, uh, from how the mind works. So symbolic manipulation and cognitive mechanisms together with, so not excluding, but together with, you know, how the brain works, which is actually, you know, our, this area of neural networks uh, uh, and looking at, uh, you know, I would say learning algorithms uh, uh, as based uh, on uh, layer neural substrata and activations as part of the uh, of the solution, but not the only uh, solution, which would be more like what we see these days, I would say, in most of the approaches to AI. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, just uh, very quickly, you know, sense and reference, this is not something I invented. Uh, a famous philosopher in the area of philosophy of language, Frege, and, and logics actually, uh, made this distinction between the sense, so, you know, the words that we use, think about WordNet, uh, without going back to 1892, if we go back to uh, Princeton WordNet, uh, what they capture is a scene set, so a set of words that have the same sense, and then reference being the grounding, so being you know being able to uh, link what you talk about with uh, uh, the word, but at, at the end of the day, with really experiences that encode uh, uh, the manifestation of the word for the human mind. Next slide, please. Um, so, and to be more specific, you know, our solution, which is again a neurosymbolic in nature, 
as three layers, not, I would say not only two. Uh, so it's never symbolic, but it also includes a leveling where we um, uh, look at uh, how cognitive me mechanisms can be uh, uh, implemented at a computational level. And this is actually an area of research that has been, um, you know, it's been going on for 50 years now, it's called cognitive architectures. And it is a way again to capture um, uh, invariant mechanisms of cognition. And invariant mechanisms of cognition uh, means mechanisms like attention. You know, the, the famous paper, attention is all you need. Well, that attention that is all you need is the working memory, but there's much more than working memory is uh, for, for intelligent agents like humans. There's a long-term memory, there's procedural memory, there's um, you know the capability of uh, uh, um, translating uh, uh, internal states like intentions into actions in the real world and processing the feedback from the real world in order to update your uh, your uh, you know your your beliefs and and act accordingly uh, and so this integration of these three levels uh, say is also quite uh, uh, new I would say uh, uh, um, and we you know we are basically you know our approach to build the decision intelligence system for manufacturing is based on these. Uh, uh, um, uh, three-layered integration that uses neurosymbolic AI methods. Next slide, please. Uh, right. So, uh, where does cognitive, where do cognitive architectures, and where does this discipline come from? Well, it comes from an observation that uh, Eber Simon, uh, uh, you know, Nobel Prize, so CMU, uh, um, made uh, a few a few years back on. Uh, um, uh, and trying to crystallize this notion of bounded rationality. And, you know, this is a stark contrast with respect to how large language models work. So as humans, you know, we uh, have limited cognitive capacity, limited information typically, and also when we make decisions, limited time. And this is something, you know, that goes back to, uh, uh, I would say, our the theory of evolution. You know, uh, to, to survive, we, need to, we needed to make, you know, the, the, the decisions uh, very fast, uh, and uh, otherwise, you know, uh, you can you can have bad encounters in the forest. But this is actually something that stuck with in our brain, stuck with our mind uh, uh, to to this date, uh, and and doesn't goes away, and 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 doesn't go away. It's the notion of bounded rationality, so being able to uh, make decisions, uh, you know, under constraints. And so, of course, as we know, large language models have the opposite. So they uh, we so there is this claim that you know the more data you feed, the larger is the network, the better will be. The, the result, but we work in the comp in completely opposite way. Next slide, please. Um, right, and then uh, also looking at the time, what would I leave some time for questions? So, uh, cognitive architectures, uh, I, I use the plural because there are different uh, types of them, like you would have different type of neural networks, so, di so di different type of, of implementations. But in the last couple of years, maybe three, four years, um, there has been, I would say, a renaissance of cognitive architectures thanks to uh, a so-called uh, common model of cognition, which is a way uh, to where basically, you know, the different uh, cognitive architecture researchers uh, uh, have identified some common aspects of their cognitive architectures that now have, have formed what is called common model. And this common model of cognition is basically a way to look at how you would go and implement uh, uh, these uh, computational models uh, of, uh, of decision, computational model of actions, computational models of memory, and so on. And there is a, ni a nice paper that you know I would I would recommend to, to take a look at if you're interested in these uh, topics on how uh, the, there has been a mapping between the human connectome data, so the, all the data that we have about uh, brain activation and brain functioning, with this common model of cognition that you can see there, sketch a little bit uh, on the. Uh, central part, uh, central right part of the slide. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I think we 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 can uh, we can just keep it this also in the interest of time. So this is one one um, example of a cognitive architecture, which actually you know is the, has been developed uh, uh, for since the early nineties here in at CMU. Uh, and then this is an example of an architecture that uh, complies with this common model of cognition and, and, and uses some um, Bayesian activation equations and, and production utility equation uh, to, again, uh, I would say, articulate the, and implement these uh, mechanisms of human cognition. 
uh, and is implemented at least uh, in in um, in Python. So it's very easy also to integrate with uh, with uh, traditional, I would say, uh, uh, deep learning uh, frameworks like PyTorch and so on. Next slide. Um, right. Um, so maybe here I just wanted to mention one thing. There was uh, so is this completely detached from generative AI? The answer is no. Uh, I was at a, at a symposium last fall uh, on integration of quality gravita uh, architectures and generative models, and, and there we explore some of the the problems, the aspects, the the the, the way the two technologies can uh, can leverage each other. Uh, to... Next slide, please. I think there is somebody in the background talking. Uh, maybe you you can skip this and we go to the one on the manufacturing. I think is the next one. I guess yeah. So this is actually my last slide. I just wanted to say again, okay, this is was more like an introduction on decision intelligence. So why is this important for manufacturing? I, I just mentioned it a little bit. Um, you know when when you have decisions that need to be made in complex scenarios like manufacturing, uh, then you know these type of technologies uh, are very relevant, very important. So far, we have uh, identified uh, a couple of interesting problems. Uh, one problem is uh, when, uh, for, the, for, for instance, a production line uh, needs to be re re reconfigured. So, for instance, a new machine is introduced in the production line or or, or um, uh, the, the, the business facility, the manufacturing facility wants to introduce a new component. That requires a lot of time, and it requires a lot of time because it's typically based on trial and error practices, so very empirical, very hands-on. But of course, if you have the capability of simulating uh, this type of uh, um, so-called ramp-up phase, again, when these production lines are reconfigured, and simulate uh, the problems that may emerge and how a human face them, then actually you are uh, reducing the time for this ramp-up phase, reducing the number of error, and also uh, enable reusability. So if the same thing uh, needs to be done in another plant, then you can have these decision support systems helping people in the other plant. Uh, and so, you know, these simulations, at the end of the day, what they do is they, they guide, they help guide the interventions of the humans. And very similar, uh, but a little bit different twist here is uh, when we talk about flexible manufacturing for uh, the optimization of production lines, mainly meaning when you want to uh, augment the output, so the, the quantity of the product, or, or when you want to reduce uh, uh, the, the time to manufacture some products, then one thing you can do, of course, and what people do over time is they review their processes and trying to you know, fix them uh, at different temporal scale, like on a, on a daily basis at the very beginning of the day in the morning, or every few months, when you know all the, the the production managers gather and look at their production output, so especially in this second uh, step, where in this macro scale, these uh, decision makers have to look at a, a, a large quantity of data to make their decision and to make these changes. And and as we know right now, this is not optimal process. So the idea is uh, to remove to relieve them with some of the burden of looking at these huge spreadsheets. By having systems that provide a summary, with uh, with uh, I would say uh, as a, a superhuman would summarize those data for the decision maker. Right. So this is my last slide, and then I think you know, if you have any question on this part, uh, otherwise we can also you know if you have other questions on the other parts. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, really, um, I think a lot of us uh, found that. Uh, this was a fantastic uh, presentation and didn't disappoint our high expectations. Thank you very much. Um, I think several of the guys uh, here, at least in my team, are working on uh, something related. So it was good. Um, and I think uh, those who are not in this field got a good introduction to what's happening, especially on complex uh, decision making or and, and you know uh, dealing with uh, complex uh, tasks. Uh, any, any questions for anybody? Okay, cool. Yeah, come. Oh, hi, thanks for the talk, Kels and Pro and Corey. Uh, so my question is mostly about uh, Bosch research. We uh, discussed a lot of things on manufacturing part. 
so is the research teams and bosch limited to manufacturing or there are some other projects as well <laughs> talk about the different industry right yes sir yeah Also, do you want to take this one? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't know how you would have answered to this, but my answer to this is um, yes. We have, you know, we have different uh, uh, use cases. Uh, we beyond manufacturing, um, and you know, some of this research uh, started in the area of uh, automotive. Um, other aspects that we touched upon in the past were on, you know, uh, customer service support, uh, um, uh, chatbot uh, uh, that can help uh, experts uh, in um, in their daily job. At the end of the day, I mean, we we actually look a little bit also at the priorities that we receive from our business units, and we repurpose a little bit our methods and our technologies. Uh, uh, to try to solve the more practical uh, problems and highest priority problems that we are uh, presented with. Uh, so definitely many other applications of these methods and technologies. Currently, our focus is on manufacturing. Okay, thank you. So just to try, I mean, I, I think Alessandro is referring to like our kind of contributions and areas of research. If the question is about Bosch in general, um, we're, we're a very large company. I, I think there's very few areas of research that you could think of that we don't, or we are not actively engaged in. So yes, we have a very broad spectrum of, of current research projects going on. I, I, I can't really mention them all. It would take quite too much yeah. time. And Bosch is, not, <laughs> uh, Bosch is not a software only company. You know? It is a substantial investment in or of work in sensors and automotive and many other areas, physical things. So, uh, yeah, robotics, many other things. So, uh, while, of course, uh, you know, these guys are more doing software-centric, AI-centric work. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, both of you. Well, um, I'll stop the recording. <laughs>